Well, good to see you again. If you have your Bibles, would you join with me today in the book of First Timothy? The book of First Timothy. When you find First Timothy, if you would join us as we stand together in reverence of the Word of God. For the third chapter, the third chapter of First Timothy, and I want to begin reading in verse number 14. First Timothy chapter 3, verse number 14. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up to glory. I want to continue our theme on Christmas today from this passage of Scripture. Brother, you're a preacher, right? Would you lead us in a word of prayer? Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. The Apostle Paul in these passages of Scripture is giving instruction as to how the church should function. In chapter 2, chapters 2 and chapters 3, he lays down some foundational issues about the responsibility of different people who function in the house of God. He reminds us in, this, in chapter number 2 that God would have all people, all men to be saved. But then in chapter number 3, he talks about the responsibilities of the pastor and the deacon. And he goes into great detail in that chapter. He is talking about conduct in the church. How is the church supposed to conduct itself? How are people in the church supposed to conduct themselves? He goes into great detail. And then in the third chapter, in verse number 15, he talks about the church as the house of God. When you think about a house, you think about a family. And he's reminding us that the church is a family. It's the family of God. Uh, we're to treat each other, not like some families, but we're to treat each other like families in fellowship. We're to love each other. We're to encourage each other. We're to instruct each other. We're to be there to help each other. We're to pray for each other. We're, up, we're to uphold the hands of the people in the church. And the reason he talks about the pastor and the deacons and the purpose of the church, not only because it's a household of faith, but he says in verse number 15 that it is the church which 
preserves the truth. <clears throat> we are not <clears throat> a group of people who uh, are th the uh, people who uh, begin the truth. We preserve the truth that's handed to us. And then he says in verse number 16, something that I want to talk to us about today. And I want you to note with me, if you will, that he says without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. The Apostle Paul is saying to this young preacher that there is a mystery of godliness. It's not open for debate. We don't sit around and discuss whether or not this mystery of godliness is in fact verifiable information. We take this information as biblical truth. Amen. And he said this mystery concerns a person. Now in the Bible there are several mysteries. Uh, for instance, the Apostle Paul reminds us there is the mystery of the church. Uh, down in Arabia, the Apostle Paul was given the mystery of the church. He said it was a mystery hidden from the foundation of the world. How that the Jew and the Gentile could be brought together, the middle wall of partition kicked down. Uh, he goes into great detail in his writings about the church. Now, a mystery basically in the Bible is something that heretofore has not been revealed, but is now being revealed. In the Old Testament scriptures, uh, the church uh, was, not, was not seen. But Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, I'll build my church, and that's future tense, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Paul got the revelation, and he went into great detail about what the church is. There's also the mystery of the rapture in the New Testament. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. There is in the New Testament what is called the mystery of iniquity. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. There is in the Bible, in the book of the Revelation, the mystery of Babylon. So there are several mysteries set forth in the Scripture. Most of them are discussed. Most, most of them uh, give us illumination and enlightenment as to what they consist of. This one here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16 is called the mystery of godliness. Now, what is Paul trying to get us to understand? He said, great is the mystery of godliness. And he makes this statement, God was manifested in the flesh. Now, the word manifested is a word which means to make known. He said without controversy, God has been made known. Now, the mystery would be this. Throughout the eons of eternity, God was spirit. Jesus said to the lady of Samaria, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The mystery of godliness is that God who was spirit would take upon himself a body and come through what we call in Philippians chapter 2, the incarnation, clothe himself in a human body and come and dwell among us. In other words, Paul is saying this mystery is God with us, like we learn at the birth of our Savior. She shall bring forth a child. 
Thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. The great truth for 2,000 years is that we have celebrated the fact that the eternal God who was spirit clothed himself through Mary. Mary giving him a body coming into this world for the explicit purpose of going to a cross and being nailed to a cross to pay for our sins, to provide redemption for us. Now, Paul said, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. If you have a different version Bible with you today, other than the King James Bible, the possibilities are good that the word God is missing. Most of the liberal versions today said that he was manifested in the flesh. They take the word God out. He could be anyone. He could be any person in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Israel, any person in the world. But he said, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. We know who this person was. We know who this person is. He was Jesus Christ, God's son, incarnate in human flesh. Now, there's a lot of debate in the world today. There are a lot of religious movements in the world today who deny the fact that God was incarnate in flesh. The Apostle Paul, as he wrote his letter to the church of Colossae, he had to deal with what was called Gnosticism. The Gnostics was a group of people who did not believe that Jesus Christ was deity. They believed that Jesus Christ was a lesser God. They believed that God was so high and so holy that he could not touch his creation. So God would spend off a lesser God, and that God would spend off a lesser God, and that God would spend off a lesser God. And finally, Jesus showed up one day from their perspective as a created being. The Jehovah's Witnesses have a different kind of Bible. In John chapter 1, verse number 1, their version says, in, in the beginning was a God. Our Bible says, in the beginning, God. Jesus Christ is not a God in that he is not one of many gods. Jesus Christ is the God, God incarnate in flesh. There's no doubt about that. And Paul had to set that straight on numerous occasions. As I said, especially in Gnosticism, the Gnostics taught that Jesus was a created being. The Gnostics said, Gnostic means all knowledge. They said, uh, if you want to know about the universe, you ask us. If you want to know about God, you ask us. If you want to know anything theological, you ask us. And Paul writes that letter to the church of Corinth, or excuse me, the church of Colossae. And he says to them, in him, in Jesus Christ, dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. What Paul was saying, that in Jesus Christ, the Godhead is constantly bodily in Jesus. Jesus was not an animation. Jesus was not one of many gods. Jesus was the divine, eternal son of the unchanging God who came to this world to take on a body so that he could suffer for your sins and my sins. And that's what Christmas is all about. Amen. We recognize Jesus Christ as the only God of salvation. We recognize Jesus Christ as God's only beloved Son, whose purpose was to bring redemption into this world. Now notice with me, in verse number 16, he says some things about Jesus. He was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. 
Romans chapter 1, he was declared to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Not only does he say he was justified in the Spirit, but the Bible said he was seen of angels. Angels played a vital role in the ministry of our Lord. They announced his birth. They came to minister to him at the end of uh, his uh, 40 days of temptation with Satan. They came to minister to him uh, in the garden. They were close by. Jesus said, I could call 12 legions of angels if necessary. He chose not to do so. But the angel ministry rejoiced on the third day of the resurrection because the Marys came to the tomb and looked into the tomb and there was an angel sitting at the feet of Jesus and an angel sitting at the head of Jesus and said to those who came to the empty tomb, why seek ye the living among the dead? There was an angelic ministry that followed our Lord around to testify that he was their creator that he was indeed the God of the universe. He was preached unto the Gentiles. And of course, we understand in the book of Acts, the light of the gospel went to the ends of the world, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. He was believed on in the world. And the Bible said that he was received up into glory. So in that verse of scripture, we have the incarnation. He was manifested in the flesh. We have his glorification. He was received up into glory. And sitting right now on the right hand of the Father is the God-man, Christ Jesus. Now listen, you've heard this all of your life, but you should never get tired of hearing it. I want to say it again. Jesus Christ was as much man as if he were not God, and he was as much God as if he were not man. He was the God-man, Christ Jesus up on the Mount of Transfiguration as he met with Peter, James, and John. The Bible said that the inward glory, the inward deity of our Savior came forth. In the tabernacle and in the temple in the Old Testament, they had this huge veil that hung between the outer court and the holy place. And that veil would represent the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. On the other side of that veil was the Shekinah glory, the divine, unadulterated glory of a perfect God. The body of Jesus Christ was the veil. But up there on that mountain, that inward glory, that inward deity, the God-man came forth. And the Bible said, in the brightness of the glory of God, Peter, James, and John looked at and they understood that Jesus Christ was deity. And Moses and Elijah appeared with him there, talking about his decease, talking about his exodus, talking about his death on the cross of Calvary. Jesus was God. Jesus is God. He came as God and he forever shall be. And the part of the Godhead that we're going to see forever in heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ. He carried with him the nail prints. He carried with him the place in his side. He carried the marks of the slaughter back with him to heaven. And I'm reminded of that in the fifth chapter of the book of the Revelation, where the Bible said that John looked at the lamb as it had been slain from the foundation of the world. Our Savior has in his bodies the marks of the crucifixion to remind us throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, the price that he paid for our salvation. Now, my friends, sometimes we hear, and I've heard and you've heard and you've read of people who uh, determined that they give away their riches and, and uh, they just uh, felt that it was their calling to help other people. But let me tell you who gave the most. The Lord Jesus Christ, who always existed in eternity, divine fellowship between he and his Father and the Holy Spirit, creator of the universe. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything that was made. Eternal fellowship with the Father, angels worshiping him, never knowing what it would be like to suffer, never knowing what it would be like to pain, never knowing what it would be like to have to die the death. 
And yet he gave all of that up, condescended, and came into this world for the reason to suffer for you and to me. He gave up the worship of angels. He came down here to be scourged. He came down here to be rebuffed. He came down here to be mocked. He came down here to be made fun of. He came down here to pay the ultimate price for our salvation. Nobody has ever paid a price like Jesus Christ paid to come into this world to die for you and to die for me. And I want to say this Christmas season, I'm elated, I'm thankful that the Lord Jesus Christ would love us enough to pay the ultimate price for our salvation. Now I want to raise the question, why did he come? There are several reasons in the Bible that teaches us why Jesus Christ came into this world. I want to say first of all that Jesus came into this world to bring life to spiritually dead people. This world has no movement towards God. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. When man sinned in the Garden of Eden, that inward part of him, that fellowship with God, it is almost as if a curtain came down on his soul. A door was closed. And that divine fellowship between man and God was cut off. The Bible says that we are separated from God. Now, in him we live and move and have our being physically. But there is no fellowship between us and God because we're sinners. We're born that way. All of us have sinned. We're born sinners. You say, well, I'm a pretty good person. I'm not denying that, but you're still a sinner. You say, oh, I put all my deodorant on this morning. I smell good. Wonderful. I'm glad you do for all of our causes. But we're still sinners. You may come out of the best family in this church, but you're still a sinner. The Bible is clear that we as sinners are dead in trespasses and sins. I noticed this morning on the way to church, people all through the community they had no movement towards church this morning. This community is filled with people who are busy doing other things because church does not mean a thing to them. Serving God doesn't mean a thing to them. The Bible doesn't mean a thing to them. Living right doesn't mean a thing to them. Why is that? Because we are dead in trespasses. And Notice what it says, trespasses, tres. We have crossed over into forbidden territory. Sins means that we've come short. We've missed the mark. We've sinned against our Creator. And as such, we are alienated from the life, the divine life of God. You can take a, and I'm not being sacrilegious, but uh, I'll use my wife as an example over yonder in the cemetery. I could take a stake over there after this service is over and put it outside of her casket. But there'd be no movement. I can stand there and speak through that wall where my wife is encased in that casket. But there'd be no movement. We could bring the choir over there and stand in front of that casket and sing Christmas songs. But there'd be no movement. You know why? Because dead people have no movement. You know why people have no desire to serve God? You know why people will have more of a movement towards the nightclub? You know why people have more of a, of a movement toward this world than they will toward God? It is simply because they are dead towards God. They have no movement. They don't desire God. 
They don't want to be with God. They don't want to fellowship with God. They don't want to read their Bible. Church means nothing to them. Divine principles means nothing to them because dead people have no movement. But Jesus came to make the dead alive. Do you know what happens when you get saved? You receive the life of Jesus Christ. Turn in your Bibles for just a moment. Turn to the Gospel of John for just a moment. The first chapter of the Gospel of John. This just comes to my mind. Notice to me in John chapter number 1. In verse number 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And notice what the Word did. The Bible said in verse number 10 that the Word came into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. Look at verse 14. Here's what the Word did. Here's what Jesus did. And the Word was made flesh. Look at that. That's what Christmas is all about. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He came into this world. And He came into this world to bring life. Look at verse 4. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus is life. Jesus is eternal life. The Word came down here and tabernacled among us to bring us life. And when you trust Christ as your Savior, you have a spiritual resurrection. You are literally raised from the cemetery of the dead, spiritually speaking. Ephesians chapter 2, let me read it to you again. The Bible said, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace, ye are saved. The very moment we cry out to God and say, Lord, save me, I invite you into my heart to become my Savior, the Bible says, all of a sudden, uh, your soul is illuminated with the divine life of the Lord Jesus Christ and you are brought out from the, your trespasses that brought you dead and trespasses and sin, and you're made alive in Christ Jesus, and you have life, and you have life towards God. You want to serve God. You have His life in you. The Bible means more to you now than it's ever meant before because you have His life in you. Church means something to you because you have His life in you. Listen, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ transforms us from the first Adam to the second Adam. Thank God for he came into this world to bring life. John chapter 14, verse number 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I'm come that they might have life. 1 John 3, 14, we know we pass from death to life. The Bible is clear when we get saved. He gives us his life. His life is an active life. He came down here to give us life, those of us who are dead in trespasses and sin. You know what makes the difference when you get saved? You have divine life radiating in you. You know why you love divine things? Because you have divine life in you. He came down here to give us life for people dead in trespasses and sin. Let me say secondly, Jesus came down here to die for the sins of the world. That's what it was all about. 1 John 4, 14, he says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Amen. The Bible said in Matthew 1, 21, She shall bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. 1 John 2, 2, the Bible says that he's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. 
The definition of the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 24, the Bible said, Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. Let me just say it this way. Jesus came down here to take our place. Amen. If that don't help you, I don't know if you could be helped or not. Everything that you and I deserved in a Christless eternity, he took upon himself. Out there in a Christless eternity, people are separated from God. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus was separated from his Father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? On the cross of Calvary, he suffered for you and he suffered for me. On the cross of Calvary, there was the thirst. He cried out, I thirst. That was not just a temporary thirst. That was the thirst that we should have experienced forever and ever, the unsatisfied thirst. And the Lord Jesus Christ took that thirst. On the cross of Calvary, he became a curse for us. Cursed is everyone who hangeth on a tree. And on the cross, he became our curse. I can't imagine what it would be like to be com completely forever separated from God. I can't imagine what it would be like to be falling and twisting and turning and suffering in the charred walls of hell, eternity without end. I can't imagine that. Yet it's in the Bible. And yet there on the cross of Calvary, he came down here to suffer for us. He came down here to take that eternal hell upon himself. He came down here to take that eternal suffering upon himself for us. When he came into Bethlehem, he knew the end results of the incarnation would be the sufferings of Calvary. He knew that before he came, and yet he willingly came, knowing the suffering, knowing the pain, knowing the torment, knowing the alienation, knowing the separation, knowing the flames of eternal burning that would be placed on him on the cross of Calvary. He knew all of that before he came into this world, and yet he gladly came down here and took our place at Calvary. I'd like to join in the words of the song, Oh, What a Savior. Christmas is all about Jesus coming down here and taking our place suffering in our place. Jesus came down here to reveal the love of God. The Bible said herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. I know some things about God by reading the Old Testament scriptures. I know that he is a God of power because I read about he created the world. I know he's a God of judgment. I read the Old Testament scriptures and I see the kings of Israel as they turned their back on God and instituted Baal worship, tore down God's altars and built false altars. God judged them. I see God judging the nation of Israel, taking them off into Babylon for 70 years because they turned their back on him. But when I come to the New Testament, I get to see another side of God that I don't see that often in the Old Testament. When I come to the New Testament, I see a God of love. A God who would love us so much that he would give his only son to come to a sin-cursed world to turn ultimately his back on his son at the cross of Calvary so that he would not have to turn his back on you and I. Greater love hath this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Our Lord Jesus Christ, by his love for us, surpasses illustration. There's nothing I can draw from today 
to say to us this morning, you want to know how much God loves you? Let me give you this illustration. If I said this morning, God loves you like a mother loves her child, that would not be an adequate illustration because there are teeming multitudes of women who go to the abortion mill and take the life of their unborn. We have some kids that we bring in on buses occasionally. They don't know where their parents are at. We can say, hey, God's love is like a mother's love. I'm fortunate. I was raised in a good home. I know something about a mother's love. But there are mothers who turn their backs on their children. There are mothers who say, I don't want my child. Not long ago in a local hospital, a mother went down to death's door and she birthed a child into this world only to tell the nurses after the child was born, she said, I don't want the child. And they had to call in social services to take the child. She wanted nothing to do with it. Mothers, some mothers, sad to say, will turn their backs on their own children. Some fathers will turn their backs on their own children. But let me tell you something, my friend. There is a love today that is greater than we can comprehend. There is a love today that is greater than we can find words of expression. There is a love today that will not let us go. A person may go to hell unsaved, but a person will never go to hell unloved because the Bible said in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world. That means God loves you. God loved me. God loves the world. There's no one in this. There's some wicked people in this world. But there's not a person in this world, no matter how far down the scales of uh, sin and debauchery and shame they have gone they still have a God who loves them and a God who would forgive them and a God who would save them. God loves us. Now, I don't understand it. I'll be the first to acknowledge I don't understand it. God knew all about us before we ever got here, and he still chose to love us. God knew we'd sin. He's eternal. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's all-wise. Omniscient. I'm not present omnipotent, everlasting. He knew all about us. And yet he chose to come into this world. And God chose to give his son into this world. Bethlehem and Christmas is all about the manifestation of the love of God. Great is the mystery of godliness. We cannot comprehend that kind of love. We cannot fathom that kind of love. We cannot explain that kind of love. We cannot adequately illustrate that kind of love, that God would love us the way he loved us, to turn his back on his own son, and Jesus would take all of that suffering that he endured on the cross of Calvary for you and for me and for us, my friend, that's beyond our ability to comprehend. He came into this world to show to us, to prove to us. God commended his love toward us. That means he proved his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Think about it. There's a song out that years ago I remember hearing. Jesus took our place. And that's exactly what he did on the cross of Calvary. He walked up there for you. He walked up there for me. He allowed them to nail his hands to an old rugged cross, put a spike through his feet, put a spear in his side, put a crown on his head and take rods and beat, those crown, beat that crown of, of thorns into his skin down against his bone structure he allowed all of that to happen, the spitting and the mocking and the ridicule. He allowed all of that to happen because he loved us. Praise the Lord. You know what I like about him? He not only loved me in the past, he not only loved you in the past, but he loves you in the present. God cares about you. I, I say it this way. God's crazy about you. God loves you. And he came down here last 
to be our great high priest. I want you to think about it. Our Lord needed a body so he could sympathize with us. You ever get tired? He got tired. You ever get weary? He got weary. Do you ever suffer? He suffered. You ever been misunderstood? He was misunderstood. You ever have pain rack your body? He did. Have you ever been falsely accused? He was. You ever been lied about? He was. You ever been disappointed? He was. But you know, the Bible says that we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. The next time you're going through a critical time in your life, I don't care what it is, Maybe your family turns against you. The Bible said that the family of Jesus didn't, didn't believe on him. They thought when Jesus started his ministry, they actually thought he was crazy. His own family rejected him. His own nation rejected him. You ever felt rejection? He did. But we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. The next time you're going through a trial, the next time you're going through downtime in your life, the next time you've got hurt feelings, the next time it seems like the world has turned against you, the next time you don't know which way to go, you just remember there's somebody that's been there before you and they understand and invites us to come boldly before the throne of grace that we may find grace to help in the time of need. I don't know what you're going through, but he does. I may not be able to help you. I may not be able to say words of comfort and consolation to you, but he can. There is a God yonder on the right hand of the Father, our Savior, who is our advocate, who is our high priest, who understands us. And the Bible said he's able to come to our side. He's able to minister to us. And he, he said before he went back to heaven, I will not leave you comfortless. I'll send the promise of my Father. And when he's come, he shall abide with you forever. There's never a day that will dawn in your life that you are alone. There's never a night when you pillow your head in the bed that you're alone. The Lord is with us. The Lord lives in us if we're saved by the grace of God and the Lord will sustain us and the Lord will help us and the Lord will encourage us uh, and the Lord will walk with us through the shadows of life even at the end of life. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for thou art with me. He took us in to stay with us. He took us in for the duration. He's not leaving us. He's not forsaking us. He said, I'll be with you all of the way, even unto the end of time. And I'm glad to report to you this morning that the Lord Jesus Christ came down here to understand the, the life that we have to live and the circumstances uh, that we have to endure and the good times and the hard times and the down times. Uh, he knows all about it. He knows what you go through. He knows what you feel. And he's able to come to your side and he's able to comfort you and help you and strengthen you in times of adversity. I'm glad today to report to you that he came down here to save us and to be with us and to understand us and to minister to us. Amen. That's enough to make a hard shell Baptist shout. <laughs> never alone and never forsaken. The Bible said there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Let me tell you something, folk. If you've walked down this journey very long, you understand what it means to be misunderstood. You understand what it means to hurt. You understand what it means to suffer. Now, I've had people to say to me down through the years, but you don't understand. I say, I may not, but there's one who does. I've stood by the bedside of people to hospital and in their own homes. 
And I've watched them in the midst of their suffering say things like this. I don't know why God's called on me to suffer like this. But I know this. God's presence is with me. I've had people to say to me down through the years in the midst of trying circumstances, I'm so glad that I can feel the presence of God. I'm so glad that I have the promises of God. Man, I don't know the times down through the years. I walked in a hospital here several years ago, Baptist Hospital in Winston-Salem. A dear saint of God was undergoing so much suffering, had surgery and things had gone bad and, and almost died. This dear old saint of God, she used to sit in a church that I pastored years ago. I'd go by her house to see her and she couldn't, uh, she had to have a cane to walk. I'd step up on the back porch and look through a screen door and she'd be sitting in there. Sometimes I'd drive up and I'd hear her in there singing. Singing Amazing Grace or some of the old songs of Zion. I'd knock on the door and she couldn't see good. She'd say, who is it? I'd say, it's the preacher. Preacher, come on in. And she'd say to me when I come in, you know, I've been sitting here today praying for you. And she'd say to me, you know, this whole body's wearing out but I feel the presence. God's been so real to me. And she said, God's so near to me. I walked in the hospital room when they take her to the Baptist hospital and she's laying there just sick as she could be. I walked in and I called her name and I said, this is the preacher. A big old smile came across her face. And she said, preacher, thank you for coming. She said to me, I'll never forget. She said to me, she said, me and the Lord has been fellowshipping this morning. Let me tell you, friend, on your bed of affliction, when you can say, I'm fellowshipping with the Lord, you're coming along pretty good spiritually. You know why? Because God wants to be that real to us. God wants to be that close to us. God wants to be uh, by our side to minister to us and strengthen us and help us and comfort us. He's there. We have a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Are you asking him to help you? Are you taking advantage of what you have available to you through the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, listen, folks. Don't close out your life without knowing the presence of God. A dear preacher friend of mine years ago, Ray Long, raised in a log cabin over in the mountains of North Carolina. He said, as a young boy, he said, I used to be out in the yard playing. And he said, my mother had an old swish broom. Now to them, an old swish broom was taking broom straw out in the field. I know what that is. My grandmother did that. Go out in the field and cut some broom straw and tie a string around it and make a broom out of it. That's all they could afford. And brother... Brother Ray told me, I've heard him say it several times. He said, I'd be out in the yard playing. And he said, my mother would have an old swish broom in the house. And she'd be, she'd be cleaning the floor, sweeping the floor. And said she'd be singing. And he said, every once in a while, I'd hear my mother. Said she'd get happy in the Lord. And she'd just throw that old swish broom aside run around through the house with her hands, holy hands held up towards heaven, just praising the Lord. She didn't have nothing as far as this world is concerned, but she had everything as far as the world to come is concerned. Oh, I've been around a lot of those folks. A friend of mine over in the mountains of North Carolina, pastor to church. One of his members called him one snowy night and said, preacher, could you make it to my house tonight? He said, why? He said, I'm getting ready to die. He said, I'm not going to live till the morning. The preacher said, you know, a lot of snow on the ground. I don't know if I can get there or not. He said, preacher, you need to come. And the preacher said he had a four-wheel drive. said he got in his four-wheel drive and went back in the mountains, a little narrow road, went over this little old log cabin down to the end of the road and walked in the house and said he was laying there on his deathbed. And he said to the preacher, preacher, I want to thank you for coming tonight. He said, you're pastoring a church. And he said, you're going to encounter people down through the years that will be on their deathbed. You're going to be encountering people that are going to be going through a lot of trouble. 
He said, preacher, I just want you to see how a man who loves Jesus dies. I just want you to experience tonight what it means for a saved man to leave this world and to go in the presence of God. The preacher said, I stayed around his bedside. I prayed, prayed with him and prayed for him. And he said, in a little while, he said, that man looked up at him and said, well, it's about time for me to go. He said, he folded his hands over his chest, closed his eyes in death, and went into the presence of God with all of the peace that an individual, it was possible for a person to muster. He said, I watched that Christian die. He said, down through the years since then, I've shared that story with other people, on other people on their deathbed, and I've told it makes a difference if you know Christ when you come down to the end of the journey. Oh, listen to me. You need to know him. He came down here so you can. Our God is not a God that you can't know. He's a God you can know. If you don't know him today, you need to get to know him. If you're not fellowshipping with him, you need to go around this altar today. And you need to say, Lord, I've let something come in my life between me and eternity. I want you to forgive me. This thing's real, folks. This is not put on. It's not happenstance. This thing's real. And if you don't know him today, you need to get to know him. If he's not real in your life, would you come today and allow him to be real in your life? Let's stand with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. He came down here to minister to us. He came down here to help us. He came down here to forgive us. Our Father, I want to thank you today that you sent your Son into this world. I want to thank you for the gift of your Son. In the words of the Apostle, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Thank you for this season of the year when once again we can be brought into remembrance that you gave your son because you loved us supremely. Thank you for these who've responded, others that need to do so, help them to come. Bless in the invitation and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed. We sing the stanza. If others need to come, would you come?